Well, hello and welcome to our video service for the fourth Sunday in Lent, coming to you from Trinity Episcopal Church in Lumberton, North Carolina. service begins on page 323 in the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us, and we in him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to thee, O Lord. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country. and He began to be in need so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost it is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, Lord Christ. Well, surely our scripture text for today is one of the most beloved sermon resources. It has it all. Sin, redemption, grace, and even the refusal of grace. And you can read it from the different perspectives. The perspective of the father or of the prodigal or of the older brother. I have preached from it in prison services and in youth services and in my own pulpit many times. Most of us have heard it all of our lives, which begs the question, I think, have we heard the story so often that we miss its shock value? Prodigal son's arrogance and subsequent destruction of his life doesn't affect us much because we know that he's coming home. 
He always does. The result of our over-familiarity with the story turns it into a predictable bit of self-help advice. Hey, no matter how badly you have messed up in life, just pick yourself up. A ready supply of forgiveness is waiting, and you can start over where you left off. In fact, however, I think the story reveals a deeper truth. It speaks of the issue of grace and what happens when it is exercised. This notion of unmerited grace makes some people uncomfortable. They seek to believe that doing the right thing and believing the right thing counts for something. And related to this is the idea that grace can be made cheap if it is not linked to repentance. After all, they might say, repentance always comes before grace. But does it? Where in the good news of Jesus do they find that, I wonder? A closer reading of the Gospels reveals that repentance is a response to God's grace, not a prerequisite for it. In the Gospels, grace comes first. Jesus' parable of the father with the two sons, I think underscores that normal process. On the surface, I know it appears that repentance comes first in this parable. The younger son is tired of his life in the pigsty, tired of starving. He comes to himself and begins rehearsing his confession of sin. And he receives grace and forgiveness and welcome when he returns to speak that confession. But the movement of the story makes clear that the grace of the Father is preemptive and not just toward the younger son. The late great preacher and professor in the Harvard Divinity School, Peter Gomes, is helpful on this, I think. He wrote, the prodigal is willful, foolish, self-centered, indulgent. He comes home only when he has nowhere else to go. The older brother is petty, spiteful, jealous, self-righteous, and rather lacking in imagination. I think we should pity the poor father, Gum said, who has to live with this conspicuous vice of the prodigal son and even more conspicuous virtue of the older brother. Perhaps he should have run away and left the place for the two of them to fight it out. The father didn't do that, though, because the story is about him. And we know he won't run away. We know of his character, his nature, because of what his sons say and do. The prodigal tells us the character of his father when he says at his lowest point, I will arise and go to my father. He didn't expect the fatted calf, but he knew enough to know that his father, by his very nature, by his very character, would not, could not disavow him, and that his father would be there to receive him. He knew that his father's nature was love, and his knowledge was rewarded and returned. So, as well, did the older brother know this, Gomes says. And it is on the basis of the father's love and justice that he complains. For you complain only to someone in whose justice you have confidence. Both sons presume upon what they know to be there and what they know to be theirs, the unconditional love of the father for his own. This is the heart of the gospel. 
and of Jesus' message, says Gomes. No one is too far gone, too low, too abased, too bad to be removed from the unconditional love of God. And no one is too good, too dutiful, too full of rectitude for that love. It is the nature of the Father to love those to whom he has given life. Some will notice that the prodigal son acknowledges his sins, but it is not the confession that triggers the love, but the Father's love that triggers the confession. So yes, repentance is important. And we see that in this parable Jesus tells where both sons need to repent in order to enjoy life in their father's house. As Alan Culpepper says, repentance for the prodigal son means learning to say father again. For the elder son, it means learning to say brother again. Repentance is crucial in multiple directions if we are to find our way and to enjoy God's blessings in this life. But is repentance the precondition for grace? No. Grace comes first. The Reverend Dr. Robert Dunham wrote this a couple of years ago. I heard a story on NPR that reinforced such a belief for me. Michael Garofalo told the story on Morning Edition about a 31-year-old New York City social worker named Julio Diaz. Garofalo noted that Diaz customarily followed the same routine each evening, ending his hour-long subway commute to the Bronx one stop early just so he could eat at his favorite diner. But one night a few weeks earlier, as Diaz stepped off the number six train and onto a nearly empty platform, his evening took an unexpected turn. He was walking towards the stairs when a teenage boy approached and pulled out a knife and asked for his money. So Diaz gave the boy his wallet. As his assailant began to walk away, Diaz said, hey, wait a minute, you forgot something. If you're going to be robbing people all night, you might as well take my coat to keep you warm. The young man looked at his victim like he was crazy and asked, why are you doing this? Diaz replied, well, if you're willing to risk your freedom for a few dollars, then I guess you must really need the money. I mean, all I wanted to do was get dinner. And if you want to join me, hey, you're more than welcome. I just felt maybe he really needed help, Diaz said. Remarkably, the boy agreed, and the unlikely pair walked into the diner and sat in a booth. Shortly, the manager came by, the dishwasher came by, the waiters came by to greet him. Diaz remembered the kid was like, you know everybody here. Do you own this place? No, Diaz replied. I just eat here a lot. The boy responded, but you're even nice to the dishwasher. Well, haven't you been taught that you should be nice to everybody? Diaz asked him. Yeah, but I didn't think people actually behave that way, the boy said. The social worker saw an opening. He asked the boy what he wanted out of life. He just had almost a sad face, Diaz said. He couldn't answer, or he didn't want to. And the bill arrived. Diaz told the team, look, I guess you're going to have to pay the bill because you have my money and I can't pay for it. But if you give me my wallet back, I'll gladly treat you. The teen didn't even think about it and handed over the wallet. And Diaz said, so I gave him $20. I figured maybe it would help him. But Diaz asked for something in return and the boy gave it to him. 
It was his knife. Sometimes grace so astonishes us that all we can do is change course. All we can do is repent, turn around. There are times I know when repentance seems to come first, but look closely and more often we will find that it works the other way around. Grace, once demonstrated and experienced, can change everything about us. Everything. Before your grace, O oh God, we stand amazed. And in our astonishment, we turn to you yet again. Amen. God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.
love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.